This is a recreation of a uh, presentation given at a RUG meeting on the 2nd of April 2015. The uh, Our Users Group is at the University of Texas Pan American. They have a web page. These uh, videos and presentations are often archived there. You can access them from here. Uh, this particular presentation document will be archived there. All of these uh, links are hyperlinked there and you can uh, reference material from there. So here's the agenda. We'd like to look at some big data. Uh, consider the question of why text analysis and who can do it. Uh, data is everywhere. Uh, we'd like to talk about exploratory data analysis and uh, we're going to focus on some examples that come from Matthew Jocker's text analysis with R for Students of, of Literature. A great text, a nice introduction to R, and some exciting things are done there. So let's begin by talking about data. Way back in the 1600s, um, Tuco, Tuco Bra was, uh, was a famous and very, very successful scientist. He was well funded all of his life. At one time he had actually an entire island given to him in a castle there where he had uh, uh, details about where, where he did uh, research. One of the things of research that he did, he was very interested in astronomy. He was the last major naked eye astronomer. He uh, developed a, a theory of the movement of planets as a number of people before him had that uh, was still working on being resolved. He spent most of his life gathering data about some planets. He, he had accumulated a great amount of data uh, during his lifetime. During about the last 18 months of his life or so, the last year or so, he hired uh, Johann Kepler. Kepler developed what is now called Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion. It was an extremely important accomplishment. Kepler was able to do that because at the time that Tycho Brahe died, Tycho Brahe died, Kepler obtained all of his observations and was able to use them <coughs> to develop his important Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Kepler was excited about this discovery. He knew, he felt very confident that he was right. Look at, at what he wrote about it. Now because 18 months ago the first dawn and three months ago broad daylight, but a very few days ago the full sun of the most highly remarkable spectacle has risen, nothing holds me back. I can give myself up to a sacred frenzy. I have I can have the insolence to make a full confession to mortal man that I have stolen the golden vessel of the Egyptians to make for them a tabernacle for my God, far from the confines of the land of Egypt. If you forgive me, I shall rejoice. If you are angry, I shall bear it. I am indeed casting the die and writing the book, either my contemporaries or for posterity re um, to read. It matters not which. Let the book await its reader for a hundred years. God himself has waited 6,000 years. See, the point was, it had been a long time that people had been talking about planetary motion. Kepler was so confident that he now was accurately describing how the planets moved based on the data that he was able to use from Kepler, from Tycho Brahe. In 2000, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey with some telescopes in New Mexico began amassing uh, astronomical data. Its archive now contains a whopping 140 terabytes of information. It, in, notice that in the first few weeks that the Sloan uh, telescope was in place, that it, it amassed more data about astronomy than had, had been gathered in the entire history of the world. Uh, now a successor satellite, the Large Synoptic 
survey telescope. Uh, 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 the, this was a telescope in uh, in uh, New Mexico. This uh, new telescope in Chile will come online in 2016, and it will acquire the quantity that this previous uh, telescope was able to gather during its lifetime. <laughs> this new telescope will gather that same amount in in uh, five days continually. It'll keep con gathering that much more data. That's a, an, an enormous amount of data. Uh, there's lots of other places that big data is accumulated. I mean, just take uh, uh, <clears throat> merchants. Uh, Walmart handles a, a million customer transactions every hour. Facebook now has more people in Facebook than in all of China. And there's some comments about the number of photos that uh, those people are uploading. Um, you may have heard that the U.S. retailer Target is now able to very accurately predict when one of their customers will expect a baby uh, based on the data of the transactions that they make. So data is readily available. Data is important. But how about text data? Consider all of the emails that are done, all of the tweets, all the text messages, Kindles, Nooks, and Gutenberg Project, lots of places that books and other things are available. Digital documents exist for almost every modern transaction. So being able to, to process that text data is, is going to be valuable. There's, there's ways that analysis of... Uh, uh, text analysis has been very beneficial. For example, in many disasters, uh, people are able to, to analyze the, the texts that are happening in tweeters and, and, and tweets and, and emails, and etc. Uh, they've been able to, to help solve disaster situations. The 4636 SMS initiative in, in Haiti uh, there's some controversy associated with it, but on the other hand, there are some very positive things that appear to have come from that. Um, there are, are other examples of, of people that are very interested in text analysis. For example, the International Association of Forensic... There, there are organizations um, that pay specific attention to analyzing text. The uh, the National Got Milk, the Milk Mustache Campaign people, uh, did a big survey. Uh, there's the name of the survey. They were analyzing what Spanish speakers, people who were tweeting in Spanish, uh, were doing as far as uh, food for breakfast. And they came to a number of interesting conclusions there. You can learn more about it at that link. Uh, Guillermo Garza alerted me to some very interesting analysis done regarding the famous, uh, the popular Downton Abbey series. Uh, there's a couple links here. Uh, I wish we could recapture the things that he said during the presentation about those. It's some really kind of exciting stuff. You can read more about those examples there. Okay, so especially with text uh, data, but also with any other data, there's a need for uh, data munging. What that means is getting the data in a form and a shape that can be analyzed. Um, text analysis with R for Students of Literature, uh, Jocker's book, is a great case study of showing how how students uh, obviously his students are, are very bright students but but chances are not many of them are computer geeks or uh, statistics majors or um, math majors and and 
yet he's helping them to be very, very successful in munging the data, getting the data in a shape that they can, can handle and being able to analyze that data. We're going to look at some of the examples that he produces. So <clears throat> let's talk about what R is. It uh, is claimed to have and, and is gaining great support among uh, data scientists to have uh, all the manipulation, statistical modeling, and, and uh, plotting power that uh, is needed to accomplish anything that you can imagine. Uh, there's a link here that will tell you more about that. Uh, R is a command line and an interactive programming language. What that means is that when you want to do something, you can just type it into the command line and it and it performs that immediately. You don't have to write an entire program for it. It's very much different than a black box uh, data in, data out uh, procedure kind of kind of stuff. So it it encourages experimentation and exploration of the data because you can see little pieces of accomplishment uh, immediately as you go along. <clears throat> because the commands in R are command lines they're just a text thing that you type in, then you could record all of those along with comments in something that we call a script. So the idea is to think about, about R and think of like a word processor or a text processor to the side of it. And you could record the things that you want to have done in, in that text processor and then it's easy to just copy and paste them into R and, uh, or if you do something in R and you want to s to save that command you could just copy it back into your uh, into your text processor there are some nice pieces of software that integrate R with a text editor uh, R studio is is one of those and we'll use that in our example in part two of this video series. Um, so at this point we're going to shift the, the presentation to uh, an R Studio script, kind of walk through some things in that script and show you some of the kinds of things that uh, that Jockers does in his book. We'll try to archive all of these things at the, uh, the RUG web page. So that's the end of, uh, of part one of, of this two-part series of uh, videos.